Okay, so what's clear is that the Jim's background, uh, if you've had a chance to read his background, uh, there's a really nice introduction to what Jim is presenting tonight on pages, uh, well, in, in the maybe page three or so of the newsletter. But then there's also, he wrote a little biography of himself, um, autobiography of his background. And, uh, you know, he, he really, it's really interesting. So if you had a chance to read it, but just to highlight a few of the elements, um, he's, he's really has a deep background in, in this, the, the upper peninsula culture of, of copper. And uh, after doing his first two years of undergrad work elsewhere, he moved right up to the peninsula, the upper peninsula, uh, to Houghton and Houghton uh, Technical College or University. And his last two years there, picked up a degree in engineering. Then after a couple of years uh, working on the East Coast, he moved back and did a couple more years of graduate work in engineering mining. Uh, so he has that background, but also it's, it's been a lifelong love for him and he's returned there and he has, he has family living in the area. And so uh, even though he was away for 30 years um, working in the coal industry, mining, still mining, mining engineering, um, nonetheless, he was always uh, coming back and working with collecting copper specimens and specifically in that area. What was clear is that the, um, well, the, the topic for tonight, the short version of is Michigan copper. The fuller version is the Keweenaw, which is the, both the county and the upper and the peninsula that sticks out into the uh, Lake Superior. So the topic is uh, Keweenaw, it's mine, Keweenaw, I'm sorry, Keweenaw, it's, it's mines and it's minerals, then and now. So Jim's story is really about copper but it's very much rooted in his own experience as a collector, as a club president, as a show a coordinator. So he's really steeped in the, in the culture. Uh, and all that is wonderful background that he's gonna share with us tonight. But it's also about a bigger picture of the American industrial development. There's how our country's industries developed and copper was at its core. So without further delay, Jim, thank you very much for joining us. And we're really looking for, we have been looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, how's the volume for everyone? For me? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, my main engineering background really is mechanical, but I've always been interested, you know, collecting rocks from an early age. And I'm a rock hound. I'm no professional at this, believe me, by any rate. Okay, let me see if I can get this thing to do it, what I'm supposed to do. Okay, yeah, share. This one? Yeah. All right. Share. Share. Okay. Click on this right one. Click. Right click. Right. What, what, yeah. what you, that we had to do the other thing, the thing over there first? What thing? Oh yeah, sorry. That right? No, the one. This one. That there we go. Slide slide show. Show. There we now go. Now do your right click. Now I can do a right click, and hopefully we'll get it. Looks like it. There we go. That's what I have my IT person for, and wife. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I really. Uh, really would have liked to have been there personally. I uh, haven't been to the Smithsonian too many times, but I've uh, been there a couple of times and thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay, Keweenaw, mines, minerals, then and now. And the then is a long way, long, long time ago. First, we need to acknowledge some people that have helped with this program at one time or another. They contributed uh, pictures and information. A uh, big one is Larry Malloy, who is, or he's a past president of the Keweenaw County Historical Society. And he and I have been friends for a long time. I met him on a rock pile, naturally, and uh, we've been together for a long time. Now we're gonna take a slight trip back in time to 1.1 to 1 billion years ago. <clears throat> I don't really know what the condition of the 
planet was at that time, except we had, you know, the supercontinent was there and we had a whole lot of things going on uh, geologically. At that time, uh, a rift opened up somewhere in this time period. And the rift, uh, if you can see this cut out here, is this is Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, Huron, and, and on so forth with the Great Lakes. And the rift is in blue. It opened up above a mantle plume that started spreading the uh, crust apart and produced lava flowing very similar to the stuff that's going on in Iceland. It, it uh, it's, was an upwelling along a, a, a crack or a series of cracks, and you had uh, lava that flowed out and accumulated and accumulated and accumulated. Uh, multiple eruptions over many, many years and also interspaced with uh, weathering. And that accumulation amounted to 25 kilometers of material being built up. And with that much weight on the surface above the magma chamber, the area started to sag above the magma chamber. And there was also uh, inflowing of material from the sides weathering. The eruption caused a, a split. There were de gravel deposits put in, more gravel, sand, uh, forming both sandstone and conglomerates, as well as some shales. <clears throat> and as the uh, flow finally subsided and the uh, magma chamber started to collapse, you had a mineral rich waters flowing up from the chamber and being deposited throughout the sedimentary material. You can see the, the bowl tape uh, subsidence here. And there was a whole lot of uh, sedimentary material. And then the minerals came up and started filling in both cracks as well as sedimentary deposits as well as the lava flows. And then the lava flows, as a lot of you know, have a lot of gas bubbles in them. Well, the gas bubbles were places for minerals to be deposited. And the minerals in that case were copper. And because of unusual formation, it was native copper being deposited. Well, after extended erosion, Eventually, this whole area was buried under the intercontinental sea. So you had a lot of sedimentary uh, and marine fossils put on top, you know, marine deposits, limestones and such put on top of it. Following the glacial period, the glacier in that area pretty much took out everything in the way of the sedimentary rocks in that area and the harder materials, which were the lava flows and some of the heavier, uh, the heavier conglomerate flows ended up with, in this saddle formation, you ended up with Lake Superior in the middle, uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula, and then its cohort on the Canadian side, Isle Royal further out in the lake, and then of course, Canada. So the, the deposits, the mineral deposits actually go down under Lake Superior and come up on the Canadian side. And I've got specimens from, from there as well, but we're gonna be dealing mainly with the Keweenaw. The material that was deposited, there's a major fault line that runs down the center of the Keweenaw Peninsula. And this is just a, a excuse me, a, a, just an overview of, of the materials and such, uh, uh, the sediments and stuff around the basalt and the main rift filling. Uh, subluvial uh, basaltic lava flow is in purple, and then there's some clastic sedimentary rocks, which were also in the rift filling. Uh, you can see it's sort of on top. 
So this is dipping down under the lake and then coming up on the other side. You can see over here, this little tiny thing up here is Isle Royal, and it also goes over into Canada. It also trails all the way down into and into Wisconsin for, for the major part of some of the uh, minerals that were there. So now we're going to jump ahead a few years to about 6,000 BC. And the first rock hounds showed up. They were <laughs> paleo Indians that came into the area after the last glacial period. And at this time, the Keweenaw was probably really more of a series of islands than it was the peninsula as it is today. Because if you go up there and look, you can see the different shorelines of the, the old shorelines of Lake Superior as the lake levels have progressively dropped for the last 6,000 years. They found native copper laying in the streams and along the river banks. And at that time, it was fairly bright and shiny. So, you know, things are pretty and shiny. They, they picked it up. And they found uses for it. They made uh, implements. They made axe heads, dart points, knife points, spear points, uh, fish hooks, um, uh, all uh, trinkets, you know, beads, that sort of thing. And they actually did mine it. And they used hand, hand implements, rocks to mine it with. They also made their own wedges. You know, we, as rock hounds, we have wedges and, and sledgehammers to crack rock open. They used fire and water. They heated up with a, with, a, uh, with a bonfire. And while the rock was hot, they'd hit it with cold water and crack it. And then they used copper wedges to split it open and extract the copper that wasn't, you know, that was still in situ in, 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 the, in the rock. A little bit later, uh, several thousand years, uh, the explore, first explorers you know, in the 1600s uh, were the French that was in that area. And then later as the American colonies uh, took over and in 1776, you know, we had a little disagreement with England and we won. And uh, at the conference, the Treaty of Paris conference in 1783, Ben Franklin was our rep. And he said, well, he says, we want Isle Royal as part of the United States. He'd heard these, uh, heard uh, stories of copper deposits from the local Indian tribes who didn't mine it, they but they had it's been had been passed down over the generations. There were these haunted copper mines on Isle Royal, so he stuck up and he wanted that. And as a result, we now have Isle Royal National Park, which is part of the U.S. It's not part of Canada, even though it's a lot closer to Canada than it is to the United States. Uh, War of 1812. Uh, kind of put a stop to further exploration for copper. Uh, westward expansion after that war bypassed the northern regions in favor of the farmland in the Midwest until about 1822 when a group of New York opportunists convinced the 17th Congress to order a survey. And like all politicians, it got tabled and forgotten. Like I said, in the, in the 1820s, the early explorers, uh, they found this huge, monstrous boulder of native copper, metallic <laughs> copper, sitting on a riverbank in Anton, on the Ontonagon River, in what is now Ontonagon County, and they went to explore it. And here that you see them in their canoes coming up to this really huge chunk of copper. Those of you that may have seen the actual boulder at the Smithsonian, this is the boulder. This is the huge monstrous piece of copper that was found and produced a whole lot of interest. In 1840, the new state of Michigan commissioned Douglas Houghton 
and a small group of explorers to actually survey the country in that area. And when he did, and he re reported back of copper that was up there, the rush was on. So the copper rush actually started in the 1840s before the gold rush. So the first you know, major metal rush was for copper in Michigan. And it was truly a outback experience, a wilderness experience, because there was, the only way you could get there was either overland or by ship. And there was no easy way to get there by ship. But the state of Michigan, all these little squares were areas that they uh, let out as leases. <clears throat> and you can see they didn't have a clue where the copper was because they had leases way over here in two of the other counties. But all the little dots are mines that eventually were, were sunk on the area that produced copper. And you can see being out in this uh, cutout of Isle Royal, there was a whole lot of mines on the island itself. So that, that's sort of uh, the, the start of it. Like I said, 1840. <clears throat> a little bit about mining. Now they said uh, my background is mining engineering. Yes, I, I do have some background in mining engineering. I spent 30 years in the coal mines and all our mines were pretty much flat and horizontal. But in Michigan, most of the, the mines, the dip that I mentioned earlier of the ore body that runs down under the lake varies a lot from one end of the peninsula to the other. Out on the tip of the peninsula, it, it only dips at about 15 degrees. So it's like walking down a very shallow set of stairs when you, when you walk down into a mine there. As it moved down toward the base of the peninsula, the, uh, the dip increases to almost uh, 60 degrees. And you don't walk down that, it's a little bit too steep. What they did was they started, uh, if they found ore on an outcrop, they would drive a tunnel in and hopefully uh, find an ore vein. And this, my crude little drawing here shows an ore vein where they would go and they would start mining up in here, set in some drill holes and shoot the rock down and catch it, put it in a car and move it out, out to the, the outside. Now, at <clears throat> this little crude drawing, if you actually went underground, th this picture is from Michigan Tech Archives. It's from the Isle Royal Mine, not on the island. The Isle Royal Mining Company was actually in the Keweenaw Peninsula, on the Keweenaw Peninsula. You can see this chute here, and they had a, a thing, uh, thing that would swing out here and put on the edge of the car, and you can see the, the track here, and there's a timber man in the back, and you can see they had to do extensive timbering to, to help hold up the rock they were mining in. Well, if it proved out uh, that there was substantial ore value there, they would sink a shaft and then off the shaft run these drifts and then start mining up in an area called a stoke, leaving little tiny pillars behind to help support it. You're looking down, this is a plan view of the stoke. You're actually looking into the, the rock face of the stoke. And the, and the earlier mines, <coughs> the earlier mines were in mostly vertical seams, which were the crack fillings that I mentioned earlier. And those were the ones that were easily found. They usually came right to surface and actually uh, the, the earlier explorers found out that if they looked where there was an Indian mining pit, they usually found a pretty good supply of copper and then they would start a mine and a lot of the mines were started on the Indian pits. Now, this may look nice and pretty, but as time goes on, these mines look kind of kind of shabby. You can see the uh, this is actually 
a, a drift area here where it's coming into a shaft. And these are the rails and stuff going down to the lower levels. And they would run a car here and then dump the car into, into a skip or a bucket and, and slide it up or haul it up the rails to the surface. If you turn around and look the other way, you can see that they extracted a lot of material. This is the this is the drift behind this gentleman here going back further, and they had uh, track and switch to switch the cars out when they got near the near the shaft. The shaft would, in this picture, would be at my back the way the picture was taken, and you can see the width of the seam is, is substantial. This was one of the uh, lava flows that they were mining. And up until mechanized mining, everything was done purely by hand. And they were, they were hand drilling. In this case, it's called single jacking, uh, where one guy would take working by candlelight, no hard hat, no safety glasses. He might have a pair of gloves. And he would use a crack hammer. And or a, a small sledgehammer and a drill steel, hand drill steel, beat on it, turn it, hit it, and turn it, and uh, the cuttings would fall out of the hole. And then they'd put in several of these holes, load it with black powder, and then shoot it. Well, if he had a buddy, they called it double jacking. And here again, one guy would hold the drill steel and turn it as another fellow would swing the sledgehammer. And you'll notice he's swinging uphill because they had to drive uphill into the vein and then let the material fall by gravity after they shot it down to the waiting cars and the drifts. So they were swinging a hammer up all shift long. Uh, and if they, if they got in enough to do like a six foot advance, or even if uh, to put in one round of powder, they were doing a lot. So mining was extremely slow, extremely hard. And the earliest people that did it up there were the Cornish that came in from England. The story that they tell about two guys working here by candlelight, if this guy here holding the drill steel wanted his partner to stop, he wouldn't yell at him. He just put his thumb over the over the drill steel. But you know, sometimes communications weren't quite good, and you, you'd have a problem every now and then. But I don't think that happened too often. But it's a good story. Okay, that that's the background for this area geologically, real real quick, and now the mines. We're going to sort of start up toward the end of the peninsula and work our way down to the base. And the uh, one of the most northern mines that was a larger mine, they're not by far not the only mine. There are mines clear out on the tip of the peninsula, old ones that never really produced much copper. But the Delaware was here again, 1840s to 1888, and then even up through 1907. And you can see it had 18, uh, in 1877, there were 1,150 population and 114 homes. In the wilderness, these places were put in, in the wilderness, literally. They had to go in there, cut trees, make sawmills, cut lumber, lay up logs, make log cabins, and build everything. Uh, stuff shipped in was extremely hard to get. Eventually, uh, the canals and stuff were completed and they were able to get the shipping in all the way from the east coast and boston was one of the big uh, areas that provided money for advancement of the mines in this area if you if you go to delaware now and notice the arrows here says this is the mine office okay if you go to delaware mine now that's the mine office all that's left is a foundation and of course, as rock hounds, we like to hunt the, the junk piles. This is the, the rock, the poor rock that they brought out that didn't have cop, supposedly didn't have copper in it. And they had to get it out of their way. They couldn't leave it underground. So they ended up uh, bringing it outside and dumping it. 
Well, Delaware was one of the Fisher mines, as well as they also mined one of the loads that the Fisher intersected, which was the uh, Delaware conglomerate. So you had uh, conglomerate pebbles with copper around them or in between. And one of the minerals that people collect up there, look for is datolite and it's a boron silicate and it uh, comes in a variety of colors and the colors are formed by various mineral minerals within them. Usually it's microfine copper or calcotrichite as red. You also have manganese, uh, some other copper uh, carbonates like malachite to give it a green color and yellow from iron and, and other minerals. These take a very nice polish and they're much sought after by collectors. This particular one is a datalite from Delaware and it's four and a half inches wide and, and three inches tall. And it shows a, a real fine nodular datalite with somewhat of a crystalline datalite next to it. Now the datalites in Michigan, uh, datalites are fairly common mineral in lava flows where you have zeolites like uh, India and New Jersey. I mean, they have datalites there, they have them in Connecticut, but the datalite they have there is usually in crystals. Uh, the, the weird thing about most of the datalites in Michigan, not all, but most of the datalites in Michigan are found in the form of a nodule. And they are found usually in, in mud seams and that sort of thing if you're underground looking for them or you find this kind of purplish mud in the dump, you know you might be onto a, a bunch of datalites that were brought outside. In fact, the, the miners found these things and they'd break them up just to see what color they were. They had a lot of fun, but they didn't bring, I'll bring them all out, unfortunately. A little further down the road is a little, little mine, Madison mine, wasn't much, never produced a whole lot, but uh, they do find, they do find crystal and copper just about every dump up there. You might, they may only be micros, they could be large, they could be small, but most, most of them are fairly small. A uh, little further down the peninsula uh, is the Empire, and it was later changed name to the Iron City, and they all, it also produced some really pretty little uh, crystalline sprays of copper crystals, native copper. <clears throat> Central Mine was one of the big mines also that paid and made a good fortune up there for some people. And they are located a little further down here again, a little further down the peninsula. Again, it was a fisher mine. And they were mining from 1854 to 1898. And 130 homes, population of 1,200 people. Uh, they had churches, they had schools. They, you know, it, it was a basically a mining town, a company town where the company provided everything for the worker. They provided the housing, the church, and the schools and bathhouses in some cases. And uh, it is still there, Central's still there. It's now a ghost, ghost town with a few live ghosts that have year-round residents. It's also one of the main restoration projects for Keelanaw County Historical Society. The church is still there. In fact, they had a wedding there this winter. If you check out Pasty Cam and uh, or, Ke or Keelanaw uh, County Historical Society page, they have an article on that. A uh, couple got married. They snowshoed out to the church and had a wedding this, this winter. And they have a bunch of things there during the summer as well. They also have a reunion every year. And they get over 100 people that are, res that, are uh, that have relatives that work there or used to work there. And they come back every year for a, a big reunion. Central produced some beautiful copper specimens. These are, these are from the semen. 
this is a, a, a specimen of weathered copper crystals from an obscure little um, exploration in the woods close to Central, but they also found some miners' candles at that same same site. Here again, it was a poor rock pile. Not every copper load turned into a mine. They did a lot of digging in the woods for trenches. In 2006, this was one of the trips that they had up there. Uh, the local club, the Keweenaw uh, Copper Country Rock and Mineral Club, runs Keweenaw Week every year, except this past year. And uh, for a fee, they will turn these doze, these piles over with a dozer to expose some new materials and people hunt with metal locators and by eye. Uh, I had extremely good luck in 2014. I found a small chunk of rock that I had trouble getting off the pile. And actually it was, my car was down with these cars here and this rock was up here. So I had to get some help to get it down the hill. It weighed 245 pounds. And when I took it to the local shop, rock shop to be cut, it turned out to be a piece of the vein that they were actually mining. You can see the native copper in here. And this is a uh, reciprocating diamond saw that it was being cut by. And everybody, everybody in the picture, including one that isn't shown here, got and me got a slab off of this piece for helping me get it to the back of the car. I believe I, just getting it out of the, the ground where I found it was difficult. Uh, getting it down the hill, I had a hell of a lot of work and I was really glad to give everybody a piece of the action. I also donated one to the Seaman Museum up there. And this is their slab. It is actually a faulted brescia if for the, those that are into geology. Uh, this is actually a chunk of the brescia and this is actually a datalite nodule encased in a piece of the, the fault brescia that was in the, the seam that they were mining. So they were real happy to get this piece because after all, they mined the seam out and crushed it and got the copper out of it and, and shipped the copper away. So the, the actual seam wasn't around anymore to even look at and getting into the mine is impossible. <clears throat> 2018, uh, there's a whole lot more gone. I've been told uh, we were back again in 2019. We were back again in 2020. This is the now. You can see the rock piles, uh, the crushed rock. This pile is owned by the Keweenaw County Road Commission, and they have it crushed for road gravel. And so, and there's not much pile left. Uh, they are just about out of rock at Central that they own. There's still rock piles there, but it's on private land, and they're wanting to maintain them for aesthetic uh, value and they'll probably never be crushed and you really can't collect on them. So we're figuring that 2020, which is what I got in 2020, and I did find finally some copper crystal groupings, three little groupings of copper crystals, a whole bunch of regular copper, uh, chunks of ore, native copper, and a nice ax head. Now, everything isn't as small as this quarter would indicate. There is uh, <clears throat> one individual that belongs to the club up there that spends a lot of time digging. Both of these specimens came out of, cent out of the central piles. This one he was digging by himself and found. And this one he actually found on one of the club digs. Uh, the club, here again, goes in and they pay a guy to come in with an excavator and move this stuff around. And he has extremely good luck, but he puts a lot of time in and a lot of effort to find the beautiful things that he does find. A little further down, we have <coughs> Phoenix. Here again, another fisher mine, 1840s to 1946. Beautiful village 
church, two churches, and a school. Uh, there's actually uh, the church is still there in Phoenix, and it is is run also by the Keweenaw County Historical Society, and they do have things there like the blessing of the animals, and they do it is available for weddings. So if you want a really unique wedding, you can schedule one at Phoenix or Central. Phoenix also produced beautiful copper as well as. Uh, fan type copper materials. Also, you start getting copper like this one, copper with an alcyme. Here again, an alcyme is in that zeolite group of minerals. Okay, so anytime, anytime you're up there, you want to look for any of the zeolites. There, there's other things, there's other zeolites up there too. Um, but uh, they're mostly micro crystals, unless, unless you get something that came out, you know, from underground in an old collection. Most of them will be in small pockets, and they do have datalite crystals as well. You do find datalite crystals, some with copper inclusions. Cliff, 1840-44, was the one that produced the first major stockholder dividend of a million two hundred and sixty nine thousand in dividends it, so it was the first profitable one and here again it was a uh, a fisher mine they hadn't even gotten into the really good copper ores yet but uh in 1844 this is basically what cliff mine looked like uh, you know in a harper's woodcut and the mine was actually a, 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 is a scene that runs up into the cliff, which is a uh, as leftover result from the last glacial period. And it also there are other extensions of cliff. This was taken from the top of cliff, looking down across the cliff drive. You can see a rock pile here and some uh, old timbers and stuff here from the old mill site. Across the road is another rock pile. This was South Cliff. It was an extension of the same vein that was mined. All this is now gone. Uh, this on this side is still there. Quite a bit of it's still there. You can see a whole lot of trees have grown up since that photo. But here's a couple of the club trips that were there. This one was in 2019. That was their one group's take uh, that came up from they came up from Wayne County, New York after my talk, and they came up and did Keewin all weekend. They went to Cliff Mine. See, they found a piece of scrap iron, a uh, bunch of nails with their metal locators, as well as all kinds of, of interesting little pieces of copper. And one person found, this is unclean, but these are definitely, uh, it's definitely copper crystals. I don't know what it looks like now. I didn't see it after it was cleaned. But Cliff was noted for copper crystals as well as silver crystals. And this particular silver picture was uh, in September, October issue of Rocks and Minerals uh, with a story by Tom Rosemeyer in 2018. They used, used this same picture. All right, other minerals at Cliff, again, analcyme, apophyllite, all in the zeolite family. Even today, uh, people running out in the woods with metal locators, this particular piece is five by three inches and it weighs two pounds. It's a native silver nugget that was found next to a uh, miner's cabin foundation. The miners had a habit of maybe taking the silver because they were mining copper and being paid to mine copper and well, Silver sort of went along for the ride, and sometimes the silver didn't make it to the uh, the mill. And a lot of times they sold the silver to the local jewelers, if there was any, uh, for uh, money to feed their family. The sizes of the copper that was found underground is phenomenal. You're talking hundreds of tons 
of solid metallic copper. How do you attack that with hand tools? This is a piece of actually float copper that they found in the woods. And they were in the, here, shown here in the process of cutting it using chisels. And you can see this slot right here. They actually start at the edge and just start taking a slice down through about a quarter inch thick. And then they'll step the chisel back and take another slice off and just keep working back. And he's back this far back through here. And you can see this gentleman here is holding the, the chisel. There is a hammerhead right here that somebody has already swung with. This guy here, he's moving, but he's also reared back with a sledgehammer getting ready to deliver another blow too. So they were double jacking with uh, a, another guy holding actually uh, the chisel. Two guys swinging, one guy holding the chisel. And they would cut through this thing and cut it into blocks small enough to handle by hand or with block and tackle. And they would load it up and if they got it small enough where they could load it on a car and take it to the shaft and put it and haul it out. And in the early days, those big blocks were shipped as is to the smelters out east because smelt they didn't have any smelters up there in the early days. They had no way to smelt it. Well, as a result of this copper cutting, it produced these chips. And these are artifacts that are collected uh, on the older mines, uh, mostly fishers like Cliff and Phoenix and Central and Delaware, where they were cutting mass copper and these chips got lost. I mean, they cut a little piece and it got lost. They, they, they would gather a lot of them up and put them in buckets or in, in the barrels and send them out, but they all didn't get found. So the chances of finding these are pretty good on the older mines. Uh, this is what we found in 2019. Uh, you can see that this one's folded over, it got bent somehow. There, some of them are real short, they're just tiny little clippets, others are real long. And they can be quite long. Uh, they can be six, eight inches, 10 inches long. I mentioned that uh, they were looking for people to back the mine, well, financially. So when they came out to look at the mine from Boston, uh, the, crew, the, the boss would have a couple of his real good copper cutters make one of these, and it's called a copper fan or a chisel chip fan. And they actually cut the chip, the, the chip, instead of cutting it all the way through, they'd cut it part way down and then bend it forward and then cut another, another chip and another chip and they leave them connected at the base and then eventually clip it off. This particular one uh, came from the CNH mine office and it's, the blades are six and a half inches long and there's nine blades they're extremely hard to find unless they're from old collections. I was lucky with this one. I've got a buddy that I went to school up there in, with. Uh, he actually went into as a mining engineer and he still works up there now uh, helping him seal shafts. This was the Vaughn shaft they were sealing in 2018. Uh, we went out in the woods to uh, check out what he was doing. It wasn't much there. It had a little tiny rock pile. I found a couple little pieces of copper in the rock pile with a metal locator. And Bonnie found a whole nice big patch of thimble berries. So she was happy and I was happy. Eagle Harbor was one of the major harbors. Copper Harbor is by far the major harbor, but Eagle Harbor is a little further down the peninsula. Also had a bunch of miners that lived there and worked in the area of a couple of smaller mines in that area. But that was the 1800s. Now the rock hounds and more adventurous miners look in Lake Superior for copper. In fall of 2008, Bob Barron, one of the local divers, with a waterproof metal locator, found this seam of copper on the bed of Lake Superior. 
And if you want to check it, the, the article is in the 2009, January, February issue of Rocks and Minerals. And the whole seam was nothing but crystalline copper encased in mud. So this, this has just been power washed. No acid dip, no nothing to clean it. And he acquired several thousand specimens out of that one particular seam. Earlier in 2001, he in conjunction with the state of Michigan who owned anything bigger than what you can physically pick up and bring to the surface, found this little piece of copper that weighs 17 tons. And it's, a, it's a piece of float that was on a reef out across the harbor from Eagle Harbor. And they enlisted the Car Army Corps of Engineers barge and their big crane to pick up this little piece of copper. And this is, this is Bob standing on top of the copper after they put the straps on it to pick it up and bring it to the deck of the barge. And they brought it back into shore, loaded it on a big flatbed truck. Here it is loaded up on a big heavy hauler, brought it in and it now sits at the Seaman Museum, which is the official mineral museum of Michigan. And it's one place you really need to go it's not as big as the Smithsonian, nor does it have the, the diversity of minerals, but as far as it has the best copper and silver uh, specimens from the Keweenaw in it. It surpasses the Smithsonian in that one aspect. And here, here is that chunk of float. It now houses is housed in a little pavilion outside. I uh, don't think anybody's gonna pick it up and carry it away. There's other things, uh, this, they found some uh, crystals, some calcite crystals in a fault brescia again, uh, along the shore of, uh, by Eagle Harbor, another area. A little further down, now we're, we went through a bunch of uh, fissure mines, okay, and some faults and that were filled with mineralization. Now we're getting into the, the lava mine that were actually in the lava flows. <clears throat> and here again, these lava flows were sandwiched like layers in a cake. And there may be two lava flows with a, uh, you know, with a, with a conglomerate load in between, you know, for the icing in the cake. But when you got, you know, 25 kilometers of stuff to work with, there's quite a bit of, you know, uh, quite a number of layers they could have been in. And most of the stuff was found, most of the, the mineralization was in the top of the layer where the bubbles were concentrated. So they were usually mining the top of the lava flows when they were mining it under. This is one of the oddball minerals. It's Mohawkite. It's a mixture of algodonite, domachite. They're all arsenic-rich coppers, and they were first found in the Mohawk mine. There, hence the name Mohawkite. And this is called spider Mohawkite because it has all these spider web pictures or uh, nice silvery material. It's it looks like silver, but it's actually not. It once you put a lot of arsenic in copper, it turns bright silver. And there's actually little star clusters of quartz crystals and voids in this specimen. This is why I picked this one up. It was cut and polished. And these voids show the crystals of the star clusters, which shows that the star cluster quartz was there before the Mohawkite was deposited because it encapsulates and also doesn't encapsulate some of the areas around the quartz crystals. Now, this is an interesting specimen I picked up in uh, 2012 from people from uh, that they got it from Mohawk One. Amik Mine, another one that actually, they actually ran two shafts. They had a vertical shaft and an incline shaft in this mine out of one, one building. And we'll get in more into rock houses and, and hoist houses and stuff a little later down the peninsula. 
But this was number three and four shaft. One was incline, one was vertical during the 50s. And here again, they ran into large pieces of copper underground. Another uh, archive photo from Michigan Tech. Now, judging by the fact that they're still running candles, I'd say all this was mined by hand. One of the most famous photos is of the rock piles with the, uh, the boiler stack behind it. So uh, we don't have active volcanoes in the Keelan on the Copper Country like they do in Iceland. But at this time, they sure had a good fake, really fake out the tourists. You can see the age of the cars in the 50s. That's the Keelan all volcano. All these piles are gone. Every one of them has been crushed up. There's nothing there. In fact, none of the buildings are there except the old hoist house. And over here is where the, the miners change house. That's all that's left. The shaft and stuff was over where these trees are. And that was in 2007. Amik uh, did produce some interesting stuff. Uh, again, copper crystals. Calumetite is a chloride mineral. It's a copper chloride that was found in Amik number two, as well as a couple of the others. Uh, with the advent of mechanical drilling, mechanical drills, uh, I don't know how much you know about mechanical drills, but the old hand drill didn't have any way of lubricating what was in the hole. Uh, with a mechanical drill drilling faster, you had to keep the heat down and, and take care of the cutting. So they ran a hole down the center of the drill steel and that hole provided water. Well, when they were drilling and they hit native copper, a lot of times copper being malleable would extrude up into the water hole, producing a drill scar with a water needle in the center of it or a water spike in the center of it. <laughs> this one is five inches long and it did come from uh, Mohawk. It came from the Gratiot mine in Mohawk, Michigan. Not the Mohawk, mine, but the Gratiot mine. Calumet and the Hecla eventually bought up everything. It became the bull in the china shop. They they hit a load of very consistent ore, copper and conglomerate, and they were very successful at mining. They had many, many mines, and they bought up all the competitors north of the Portage, which actually cuts off the Keweenaw Peninsula now. So the Keweenaw Peninsula is now an island, except for a bridge that connects it to the rest of the United States. And when you have copper in a conglomerate load, you have produced two types of things. You can have copper around a pebble, and if the pebble falls out, it's called a copper skull. And if the copper replaces the pebble, you get copper replacement boulders. Kearsarge mine, a little further down again, another Calumet and Heckler mine, uh, produced this thing called the Buffalo. It is native silver crystals and it is at the semen in their, in their collection and on display. And you can see the, this looks like about 1920s maybe, I don't know. I don't know when the photo was taken of the, of the Kearsarge. Kearsarge does produce a lot of silver. It also produces some mohawk. Osceola mine, you can see the underground here, they were, uh, I don't know exactly. I think they were diamond drilling in, in this particular uh, photograph. But uh, here again, for micro collectors, this is a copper crystal that's about uh, three eighths of an inch square with a little tiny uh, dodec. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, octahedral face on the corner of it uh, in a bug that isn't much bigger than the crystal. So sometimes the crystals are really neat in, in these little bugs. Uh, I see also produce some real pretty scraggly looking copper crystals. 
and Adelite. This particular one is from CNA, the CNH collection also. It's sort of a white Adelite with tiny pink marks in it and then it stop the recording. Ah, somebody caught it. Okay, uh, copper included agates. Uh, you can see the banding in here. What it is, is that they, it ended up being, in some cases, it was a deposition of copper and then a deposition of agate. And they're extremely well liked by collectors as well as being real pretty to, to cut and polish. It's not the only place you can get them. This one is from CNH number 20 Mun Mai. Uh, you can uh, see it. This one is in Matrix. It's just a polished nodule in Matrix. A little closer view and micro view, you can see the, the copper and the agate banding uh, where they alternate to give it the color. We're still hunting rocks uh, up there. <clears throat> In fact, we'll be there this fall at Keweenaw all week. They're going to be doing this one. This is Seneca. It's one of the uh, Majoloid mines. Produced some real pretty copper crystals, as you can see here. This was in 2018. Uh, they set up a little tent for shade and have a bunch of stuff for people to look at and drinks and stuff for, to keep you cool. And then they turn you loose on the pile. Well, while they're working on the pile with a excavator, you can't be on the pile. So you can look in the parking lot and no parking lot was safe that year because they had a, they had a glory hole started here right in the parking lot by the cars. I don't know what they found there, but they sure were digging a big hole. And that's the problem when you dig in the parking lot, it's been run over so many times, it's like digging in concrete and it's miserable stuff to do, but you never know what you're gonna find when you get a good hit on the metal locator. Uh, in 2019, I found this particular bug of copper included agate. Only unfortunately, I didn't know it was copper included agate. I thought it was just an ag uh, just a copper nodule and I hit it. And that's when I found out I had copper agate and an epidote crystal in the bug, but it survived. Luckily, it's now in my collection. We now are on the shores of the uh, Portage Shipping Canal. <clears throat> and on the North Shore is the Quincy Mine. And they're the only ones still on the North Shore that own property up there other than C&H. And they mined from 1853 to 1945. And they also remined their crushed sand from their mill up into the 60s. And they produced uh, copper from the Puwabic load, which was an amygdaloidal load, and several other mines along that same vein. There was Franklin, Menard, they all eventually became part of the Quincy properties. They bought up everybody on that, that particular load. Quincy number two in 1950 was in pretty sad shape. And now I told you I was gonna tell you a little bit about the buildings. Okay, this is basically a building that covered the shaft and it also had um, equipment up in this vertical portion here to crush and sized rock and get it down small enough to put it in a bin. And down here, they had rail cars that would come through and take them to the mill. The cables, the hoist itself was located in buildings back here and ran up through a series of support towers up through the top and then down into the shaft. And you'll notice this is one of the steep ones. It's about 68 degrees. So, the shaft is fairly close to what you would call the rock house. So this is a shaft and rock house, shaft and rock house combined. If the load is flatter and uh, less steep, a lot of times it was two separate buildings because they didn't bother with sheeting the material between where the shaft was and where the, the rock house was located. 
Today, it's part of the Keweenaw Historical Park area run by the Parks Department, the uh, National Parks. And it, it's, it's unlike other national parks, it's a whole series of small, loosely connected areas that are part of the park system. It's not one huge, massive area. So the Quincy's part of it, the Delaware Mine Underground Tour is part of it. Uh, you know, uh, even the, the Keweenaw Historical Society stuff is part of that uh, park system. If you get there, you need to go in and see the hoist. The hoist is the world's largest steam hoist that was ever built. And it, it was able to haul from underground at 9,000 feet, which is the depth they reached with their shaft. They were 9,000 feet along the shaft. <clears throat> and the, the drum is 35 feet in, in the major diameter. Uh, there's all, they have tours of the hoist house. Uh, they have walking tours of the shaft house. You can see how steep the shaft was. This is actually the man trip car that carried my men underground. They sat on these little benches with no seat belts. Uh, OSHA would have a field day with this now, but uh, that's the way they got the men underground in the later years. The earlier years, they, they climbed up and down ladders, which was a lot of fun considering they were paid from the time they got to the work phase uh, till the time they quit and the walk in and out was on their time. Quincy produced here again some nice copper. They also produce really nice copper crystals. This is not one of them. It's a fracture filling. Uh, and they did have some white datalite, which is kind of pretty. But one of the things they're really famous for is the copper included calcite. Also, again, part of the, the Quincy area, the Franklin Menard mines produced one of the prettiest colors, the yellows and red and yellow red combination data lights. Highly collectible. This is one of the, the uh, just a chunk of, of polished data light that's from the Menard. And like I said, they did have nice copper crystals as well. This one is, uh, four and a half inches from, from there to there. So it, it's not a, not a micro specimen. Looking across, across, the, across the portage, you can see, uh, see these two hills. This was back in the 60s. And these were actually huge piles of rock. If you go there today, there's nothing. They're gone. It's all been crushed out. I was a buddy who was doing some work stealing the Hero Number Six mine at Old Alro location. And we got in there. You can see here they've got the rebar they were getting ready to pour. But we were picking up chunks of copper and matrix that we later cut and made into bookends. Now there's nothing left but a, a steel stack sitting out of a, a graded field. But I did go back in 2018, and this is the field that's all overgrown now with its little stack sticking out for vent. And they had piled up a bunch of sand here from a flood in 2018, and I did find a in there. So always keep in mind if you're up there with a metal locator, if you see a sand pile, Look for float copper. That's the stuff that got torn out by the glacier and it's everywhere up there in the woods and they still find it today and lots of it, but it takes time. Copper Range owns everything south of the portage. This is Painesdale in the early, early days. Number four shaft house. Uh, they're trying to uh, get this into the historic register and try to recondition this particular shaft. Here again, you see how steep the, the, the ore body is here. This is another one that's at about 
between 60 and 70 degrees. This is number four. This little ghost right here could have been me. I was helping my buddy do some work underground here uh, legally. And uh, we were walking up, climbing up and down the ladder and the shaft, the ladder room broke on me, but I was able to hang on. So uh, our little ghost here doesn't have a friend of keeping company anymore. Painsdale used to be able to get there. It was home by the Houghton County Road Commission. Here again, uh, what the Houghton County the now up there, the collecting is getting really thin. There's still a lot of exploration to do in the woods, but it takes a lot of time. Or if you go with the the, the, the Copper Country group when we prepare a pile and, and do the thing during uh, K-Week. <clears throat> this is a picture of the mill at Frida, early picture. Uh, in 1966, they were scrapping the mill. There's not much there. They all the equipment out of the mill. And this is 2004. Uh, the lake is reclaiming this mill site. It's undercutting this whole foundation that used to be the floor of the mill. The lake is, is coming in underneath. They replaced the steel stack with a concrete one. It's still there. All these foundations up here used to carry the ball mills and crushers and stuff to process the ore. Uh, still find things in the woods. This is a, a piece of actually crystalline float, but it's, it's so heavily oxidized and weathered that uh, it's pretty hard to tell. You can tell that it used to be real pretty crystals at one time, but not anymore, but it's still a pretty specimen. Indiana mine a little further down the peninsula is uh, 19, early 19, 1847-1900s, uh, produced some real pretty copper crystals. Caledonia, I spent a lot of time down at Caledonia when I was a student up there doing some midnight mining. And uh, <clears throat> this is a picture in the, I think this was done probably in the 50s. This looks like a 50s vintage car when they still had their Quonset hut and the attic and the hillside is back here. This was actually put in on, on an old Indian pit way back in the 18, early 1800s. Uh, they ran this out and put it into this rock house and very crude little one. They dumped it in. It was all wood and they, they actually trucked it from here to the mill. And this is a 1960 picture. In 66, they still used to allow collecting underground. Since then, the owner, Rich Whiteman, who is Red Metal Minerals and produced a lot of the specimen copper you see Tucson and some of the shows. If you see uh, Caledonia Mine, it probably was done by him. This was one of his collecting things they used to run where he'd bring out a load of material and people would look for datalites. And some people like to sit down while they're looking for datalites. Others use the head down position. What they were looking for was these pretty brown and blood red datalites that uh, Caledonia is noted for. Here again, the, the blood red color is either calcotrichite or very, very fine copper or cuprite. The last operating copper mine in Michigan was the new white pine mine. It closed in 1993. It opened in the early 1950s. So it had a pretty good run. It was running while I was up there. I've got, I had been able to get in there a couple of times. And on the, when I was in mining engineering, we went on trips and got to see some of their operations. It was a massive area. They were actually mining a sedimentary shale. It's a none such shale. And their primary ore was a sulfide, not native copper. However, it did have native copper. This, this beautiful 20 centimeter tall uh, arborescent 
display of copper crystals is at the SEMA that came out of there and they had some real pretty octahedrals and, and twins and beautiful crystals. But since it was a sulfide, they also produced calcopyrite, calcite, beautiful double terminated calcite crystals, uh, silver crystals, a lot of silver, and even galena, which was surprising. I didn't, you know, never dreamed that they'd have galena there, but they do. They actually have spalerite up there too, but it's extremely rare. I've never found any. You know, the spalerite's a zinc sulfide. So any of the sulfides showed up, including barite. And here's an example. Example, barite with native silver that's coated with possibly anabergerite. And they also have calcasite crystals. This is a, a twin cal, uh, calcasite crystal. <clears throat> like I said, they're still finding stuff in the woods. This, this is from an article, again, Tom Rosemeyer, May, June 2018, Rocks and Minerals. Uh, they found a silver deposit in the woods in you know in a scene here again running a metal locator that's a close-up micro crystals of silver the latest thing <clears throat> is a trademark thing called uperite or uperlite and it's a fluorescent sodalite that came from a cyanide, a cyanide igneous rock in Canada. The glacier grounded off of Canada and dropped it all along the, the upper peninsula of, Mich of Michigan. And it's found all the way from uh, the Sault Ste. Marie, which is the extreme Eastern end of the upper peninsula and all the way actually over into uh, Minnesota and Nova Scotia. And I'm sorry, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And according to some friends of mine, they've actually found it on the shores of uh, Lake Ontario. So it really got around. Uh, the guy that found it, uh, this uh, Eric Rintan Tamaki Rintamaki, uh, in 2018, he actually sent it off and had it checked to see what it was. He was out playing around with his blacklight one night on the beach and started finding it. And he's trademarked the name. So. You can't sell it as uperlite. You can find it, but it's now just fluorescent soda light. And here's a group that I had up there in 2019 from Wayne County, New York. Uh, they were killing time, waiting for the sun to go down. They were picking agates on the beach here, looking for little ones. And once the sun started to go down, they got out the black lights and started hunting. We found these, uh, that particular trip, Bonnie and I did just walking along the beach. And in 2020, we we're up there during the pandemic, but there wasn't anybody, too many people around. We were out on the shore and the waves were really crashing. And uh, this is what they look like on the beach. They don't look the same, but when you hit them with a black light, they glow like crazy. So it's, they're pretty hard to hunt during the day. Unlike agates, you can hunt them during the day. But uh, trying to hunt these during the day, you'd be picking up a whole lot of rocks that didn't do anything. Minerals, this is two lists of minerals, primary and secondary minerals uh, done by George Robinson uh, of minerals in the copper country. If you're interested in collecting, uh, try and get every one of these in your collection. Uh, I'm not even close, but I'm working on it. I do have things like gypsum and hematite and hulandite and a few of these other ones and fluorite. And now I, I, you know, I've got galena, so I'm getting there. The state gemstone of Michigan is greenstone. The mineral is chlorasterolite. It's a, it's a gem variety of pompeliite and it is a, it produces a turtleback pattern when cut of dark and light intersecting spider web patterns. Uh, this is a, a chunk of one from the Phoenix mine. It's also found in the mines on, on shore. 
can't collect on Isle Royal anymore where they originally found it, but you can find it on the mine dumps. If you're interested, this is a close up of it. You can see the, the uh, radiating crystal structure and these boundaries here is what form the light areas when polished. I just love data lights. And this one came from the, key, the tip, actually the kip of the Keweenaw. There, there's a little seam out there that runs out into the lake and people dive for them. And they're also, they also get washed up on the beach out there. This one is from a little mine called the Nassau down in, in Noggin County. Uh, this particular one came offshore of Isle Royal before it was a state park. And it's one of the largest single data lights and it's flawless. The white coating on the outside is due to the fact that it's been immersed in water. It was weathered out of the uh, volcanic seam and it had been in the lake until the divers found it. Uh, Centennial Mine produced these beautiful white and green, blue, greenish blue material uh, data lights. It's another one that, that's really sought, sought after just for the color of it. Micro collectors, you got your pick. Uh, you've got all the zeolites to choose from. Uh, this one particular is red and alcine with calcotrichite inclusions. Uh, you also have little tiny copper groupings. This is a, a copper ring. It's actually a ring of crystals that I dissolved out of calcite from the Kearsarge mine. And it's only three millimeters in diameter, but there it, it's just a beautiful little micro specimen. More micros, uh, selenite with uh, malachite from the Kingston mine. Uh, this quartz crystal from Caledonia has got micro crystals of copper laid in on the growth lines. One of the rare ones up there is kinoite. It is a calcium copper hydrated silicate and it is beautiful shade of blue but it's only found in micros. It's either found as single crystals and groups of crystals in calcite. And this one's been dissolved out slowly with vinegar. And, and it's also found included within quartz crystals, clear quartz crystals. I've got my set. Uh, I've got one here and I, on the same piece, along with a pretty little copper crystal, is a double terminated calcite with kenoite right in the center of it. And the crystal is only like, you know, three millimeters long, but it's a gorgeous little one if, and it's micro. Holy grail is polite. Uh, it is a tungsten mineral found only at depth in one mine and that was the Tamarack mine. It was 4,000 feet straight down and the only place you're gonna find them is from a, an old collection uh, or maybe baby on the rock pile, but the rock pile is like right in the middle of town and it's on private property, but it's extremely hard to come by. So I, I, I consider myself lucky, even if it's only uh, you know, about a half inch long. <laughs> Haven't found this yet, it's babbing tonight. Uh, here again, it's it's a it's a manganese mineral found up on normally up on the point. It's up further up on the point. This one is from the Clark mine, which was one of the old fisher mines. All right, other things to do while you're up there, other than beach combing, getting your feet wet, hunting the beaches, you can prowl a few piles that are still relatively <laughs> open. Uh, found this piece, you know, I, I usually try to stop at Kingston and find some neat, neat stuff every year. Uh, I'm in there for 10, 15 minutes and pick up a, a small handful of little tiny copper pieces. It's a, it's a fine grain conglomerate they were mining. And they have rock shops, they have shows, Ishpeming and Houghton has a show. Um, they have a tourist trap in Ishpeming called the Youpers Tourist Trap. I recommend stopping there. It's fun and it's free. You have wildlife. When we're usually up there in August, uh, the sandhill cranes are 
getting ready. They've had their chicks and the chicks are almost big enough to head south with them. Uh, frogs, moose crossing, never seen one. I saw one dead on the highway one time, but I never saw a live one yet. I'm still looking. Uh, we got lighthouses. We got views. We got endless beaches with nobody there. If you're in the mood and you have your artistic talents, use some of the local rocks to create your own art. Or take in the mines. This is one of, one of the other mines. You can see the hoist house here. And here, the shaft is way over here. This is where the rock house was. The shaft is way over there because it's only like 45 degree slope. An underground tour at uh, Green, Greenland uh, and the Seaman Museum. And what we always like to do at least once while we're up there is watch the sun go down. And so if you want to try a rock hunting trip to the Keweenaw where the mines, minerals, history, and the color all come to life. And this is the end. Like, what? I stopped the share. Well, you need to get out a presentation. Oh, okay. Well, it's okay. It doesn't matter. So just okay. Jim, right. that was terrific. Are we back? <laughs> Didn't I, lose anybody. I can see. And I see one chat, but I don't look at the chats. Uh, any questions? Is the, the smelting right there um, adjacent to the mines, or uh, where was smelting done? What's that? The yeah. smelting of the, the smelting. Uh, the smelting was usually done along the shore. The uh, Portage Lake, which is in the that area between, you know, connected with the shipping canal, there was a lake there, so they didn't have to cut all the way through. Uh, there were a lot of mills along there, and they dumped the sand right into the lake. And uh, Frida is right on Lake Superior. There's no sand there anymore. All the sand moved from Frida up to Houghton, up to, you know, and uh, uh, the Gay, uh, the mill of Gay, most of their sand, they're, they're trying to reclaim it now out of the lake and, and squirrel it back on the land where uh, it's not a, a toxic waste. You know, their 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 uh, ore had a lot of uh, arsenic in it, so they're concerned about that. But I mean, it it's when they milled it along the lake in the you know early eighteen or eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds, they weren't worried about it. You know, it was a good water source, and you needed a good water source to mill. Now, Cliff milled right at the site. They had a creek there, so they milled right there. Uh, they didn't smelt there, but they did mill there, and they, they shipped their copper then out east to be melted down and cast into uh, copper ingots. Uh, actually, the biggest uh, production area, the biggest production was, we had one big production spike in the in the time of the Civil War in 1860s, and then they had another one around World War One, and then after that, it slowly, you know, trickled, trickled as the loads got deeper and harder to mine. I've got a few things for show and tell. I mentioned uh, early miners. I hope you can see this. Uh, this is a hammerstone. You can see the groove in here. It was used, this one came from Montanagan County, and it was, you know, put into a fork stick, tied up, and used like a hammer. Uh, they weren't, they also had hammer stones this size. <laughs> you can see the groove down the center of this one. This is the 20-pound sledgehammer version of early mining. <laughs> We're, we're not sure whether they hefted that one or they just rigged up a tripod and swung it. <laughs> you know, swung it against the rock, back and forth against the rock face. Uh, I was talking about some of the things that uh, I got to watch this. This is a harpoon. 
you can see the hole up here in the corner where they had the lanyard. It has a pocket on this end to fit into the, the throwing stick or the spear. And they use this to spear fish. And all this was done by, you know, early paleo Indians. The middle one here is an actual awl for punching holes in leather. This is a dart point, and this I think is a spear point. Don't really know for sure, but you can see how big it is. Beautiful workmanship, considering they were working with a, a white oak fire. And uh, they also learned that copper work hardens, and you could anneal it and work it again. And then they work hardened the edges and sharpened it. You know, they, they hammered the edge, got it sharp, you know, got it hard, and then ground it to a, a, a sharp edge. So they had knives and, and all kinds of interesting things. Early mining implements, uh, I mentioned the, the candles. This is the candle spike and one of the old candles. This particular candle came out of uh, uh, the Copper Range uh, warehouse in Painesdale. Earlier mining lamps, earlier mining lamps after candles were these little, what they call sunshine lamps. It looks like a little sprinkling can. Uh, then they then they went to carbide, the carbide lamps. And this is one of the hats from up there. And what I found out is uh, their heads are a whole lot smaller than mine. <laughs> I can't even get that. It said, you know, it's like, ta da, you know, it, it doesn't fit, man. You know, uh, interesting stuff. But uh, that's what I do for fun. Uh, if any of you are interested, uh, uh, send me an email. I've got, uh, I hope they come out right. Is that legible? It looks yeah. backwards. Okay. Oh, okay. Up here on my screen, it's backwards. Uh, this is Red Metals. This is the book that Copper Country Rock and Mineral Club put out a long time ago. They still got a bunch of them. They sell them uh, the seven dollars. It, it's got uh, maps and uh, pictures and you know things on copper crystals and such in here. Minerals, min list of minerals that are up there and maps the different areas. Some of the areas you can still get to, you know, that are still open. But here again, private property, lawyers have really, you know, and insurance has really put a bite on it. And a lot of, a lot of the piles are owned by lawyers and they won't let anybody on them. They're just holding them as an investment to sell them off for fresh rock. And of course, all the minerals go with them, you know. <laughs> Of course, if you follow the trucks out into the woods where they're dumping it for the logging roads, there's nothing to say you can't walk the logging roads with a metal locator. But the, the truck drivers have gotten really good at carrying their own metal locators now. They, they, you know, at first they didn't. They just dumped the rock and went on. But Datalite is not picked up by a metal locator. And neither are, you know, artifacts and such. Uh, like... I was talking about the chisels. This is actually one of the chisels and it's about two feet long. You can see the, the point on it and it's, it's flared out at the end uh, to cut relief for the, for the chisel chips. And it's, you know, this is a short one. Uh, they found one up there the, the last or two years ago that was like eight feet long. That, that was on the end of a piece of drill steel that was about six feet long. And evidently it was for, you know, cutting far away. I don't know, from wherever, wherever they were. So I hope you had fun. I hope you're interested. Uh, any, any questions? You know, I've been running my gums here for a while. So there are some questions. I, I was noticing you had a number of specimens that came from Tamarack Mineral. And uh, had a um, provenance of uh, Wayne Sukow. Um, he was one of our local area people around here. He was president of the Northern Virginia Mineral Club 
uh, for a number of years. Uh, and I know he was quite enamored of the datalites and the uh, copper replacement agates. Hey, so, Suko. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've got some of his. <laughs> and when he, you know, when he, when he uh, was reducing his collection, I've got got a couple of his datalites and that sort of thing. Uh, I've I've listened to his talks on you know the theories of copper agates and the micro pictures of you know the little tiny copper Christmas trees growing into the agate you know some really interesting stuff. Anybody else with a question for uh, Jim? Um, Jim, hi, I'm Kathy. Yeah, okay. uh, micro mineral collector. <clears throat> I'm curious, you mentioned, well, actually I lived in Wisconsin most of my life, and then we, we went Lake Superior collecting agates. Okay. Um, we swam in Lake Superior too as kids because we didn't, we didn't have any choice, so darn cold. But you mentioned copper like on the northern part of Lake Superior in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, the same ore body? Yes, it, it, it actually, it, it dips down under the lake and comes up. It's a big saddle. It dips down under the lake and, and appears on our royal, which is parallel to the Canadian shore. And it also appears on the, on the Canadian shore on the other side of the lake. Hmm. Because Lake Superior is really deep. It's the deepest, the Great Lakes, uh -huh. like a thousand feet deep. Yeah, it goes that far down. Uh, Quincy was down 9,000 feet on the on the shaft and but they're they weren't quite under they were they weren't out far enough they're too far away from the lake for that to to have reached you know where they were actually under lake superior but they they were still in the in the 90 to 100 degree range in the rock temperature mm. it's like mm. the gold mines in south africa but they didn't have the cooling you know, it was all, you know, they had a lot of natural ventilation. They didn't have the big mine ventilation fans at that time. They used, a lot of them used force. Uh, they'd build a fire and use the draft to pull air, air through the mine. But uh, it was very, very hot down there. But, you know, the guys stripped down to the waist to, to work down there. And then when they came out, they progressively put more and more clothes on, especially when they came out in the winter up there. Mm -hmm. and then walk to the bathhouse. <laughs> is, it, is it Jim or James? Jim is fine. Okay, Jim. Fa you know, fascinating presentation, very, very broad spectrum. Yeah, I, I try to get, you know, some pretty pictures and, and some mineral pictures and some history and some geology. And it all turned into one mining. It, it was great. I, I wanted to ask, it was to me fascinating. I hadn't never thought of Indians, as Native Americans as doing mining, but did the uh, any of the Native American nations use silver at all? I've got my name interest here. Because uh, you had they use silver. silver from up there. I don't know for sure. I imagine they did if they found nuggets. <laughs> you know, the silver's not as plentiful as the copper sure was. yeah they they do find uh, spear points and such with copper and silver in mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. yeah but uh, as far as you know just mining the silver for silver mm, i don't think so but uh uh you the time period you're talking about you know six thousand to yeah. probably three thousand bc um uh, they traded copper all up and down the Mississippi Valley and the Ohio River Valley because they traded for flint. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they found copper arrowheads and artifacts in the mound here in Charleston, West Virginia, mm -hmm. and they came from up there. Mm -hmm. uh, they also, you know, had uh columbus was given copper artifacts when he he was in mm -hmm. the west indies and they figured that came from up there as well hmm. oh you know uh, it, oh. you know it, it was it was a valued thing because one it was ornamental and two it was it was a useful you know 
other than stone tools, it was, you know, or bone tools, it was, it was something I could use until the white man came along with his iron implements and kind of displaced it. Anyway, thanks again. It was first rate. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's always fun to talk about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Nope, that's fine. Uh, Actually, I have another that those uh, Cornish miners made. It. We had a presentation on mining in Cornwall earlier in our uh, season this year, and uh, interesting that those cousin Jacks were there in Michigan as well. Yeah, they they were brought in first because uh, they were miners and they were copper miners, you know, in Cornwall. But when they got up there, they ran into something they'd never seen in Cornwall, which was native <laughs> copper. You know, uh, they were mining, you know, uh, I guess uh, sulfide ores mostly at, out mm -hmm. over there. And, uh, and they, they never run into native copper and they didn't really, they, mining methods up there sort of evolved over the years because they had to. I mean, the, the first mills and stamps that they used were just gravity stamps with uh, rock heads and rock you know, they had two big chunks of rock to, to beat the ore. And <laughs> the ore up there was not that soft. <laughs> and they ended up, you know, using you know, eventually went into steam stamps where they actually drove the, the stamp down in, you know, banged it. And uh, Tamarack Mills on, on Lake Linden, uh, they said, you know, that mill ran 24 seven, you know, and all of a sudden it got really quiet, you know, and people didn't realize, you know, the mills had quit running, you know. <laughs> they knew when the mill was down because the stamps weren't running anymore, you know, they weren't running. They, they still have one stamp way up on top of a, a concrete foundation in Lake Linden, and that uh, was the top of the mill. They, all the rest of them were scrapped out, but that one lonesome steam stamp is still sitting up there on top of the on top of the foundation and they're, they're you know they've got a little narrow gauge railroad around there uh quincy had its own railroad uh roundhouse engines rolling stock cars everything that that ran to their mill and cnh had had theirs and copper range had theirs and now and and they uh they had uh trolley cars but in, in later years you know they had an opera house in calumet Calumet was bigger than Detroit at one time. They had an opera house. Uh, they built an opera house. They, you know, it was the, the, the epitome of, 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 you know, beautiful things. I mean, the architecture is pretty. They use beautiful sandstone. They, they, they car, you know, beautiful carvings and everything else. And, uh, but now, you know, all the, all the railroad beds and trolley car, line beds are snowmobile trails and ski trails and dog sled trails and you know we have some uh, uh, mining in pennsylvania for roofing granules that they use in shingles and the, the these green stone yeah and they they crush that and they they run into copper every once in a while and it, it, it's a very similar type deposit. Yes, it, it's well, it's, uh, it's very the pleasant for them when they run into oh, yeah. it because it gums up their pressures. The yeah, malleability yeah. of the metal. Uh, they, you know, they started with the uh, the rock part of the, what the rock house did. They they had uh, grizzlies or uh, big screens up top that select kept out the big stuff, and they had guys that worked up there and pulled the bigger chunks of copper off to the side. And then they had a little steam, a little air or steam stamp up in the top of the rock house that they would beat the rock off of it and then just take mass copper. There was actually another small bin you couldn't see on the Quincy thing, another tube that they used for mass copper. And they would drop it down that. If it was still too big to go down the chute, they actually had a jib crane that ran out from the top of the, the hoist house and they'd lower it down onto a car and then take it that take it straight to the smelter. And the smelters they had had removable lids. The, the tops of the smelters would, would, would swing out of the way where they could lower this huge chunk of copper into the molten metal to melt it and then put, you know, put the lid back on the furnace. 
that's the big, you know, that's how they handled the big stuff. And then the big stuff was shipped, you know, the early, in the early days, the big stuff was all shipped out east. Anyone else with a question for Jim? If, if not, we'll move on to our... Um... Catherine's got another one. I have one, one, oh, Kathy, one sorry, I see for Jim or anybody. How do we successfully clean copper? Depends on what it's in. Uh, is it... Just, just copper. Just pure copper. Are you looking for like silverware and... Pots and stuff like that, or no, you look at mineral it. specimens, thumbnails. Yeah. I'm talking geology you specimens. You don't clean them. My goodness. What? You don't want to. You don't want to ruin them. Well, well it, they don't look in some right. cases, yes. Uh, uh, some of the the good mineral specimens up there are actually found in an epidote type basalt. Actually, within the basalt itself, which is weird, but it for some reason they you know, or they find it in prenite. It's encased in prenite, and prenite's not attacked by any normal acid. Uh, you can use hydrofluoric, which I don't recommend. Uh, it's nasty stuff, and it's it can be real deadly. Uh, but it has been used on on in special occasions to clean certain specimens. But in general, if it's in calcite, to do. Now, when we're doing the Kennaway, I, I do it in just white vinegar and then watch it. You know, let it run for a half hour and pick it out and look and see if, see if the crystals are popping out yet. Uh, <clears throat> vinegar, white vinegar is, is slower. Sulfamic acid is the go-to one that most of the locals use. And it's done, it's similar to oxalic, not as nasty, uh, but you do it warm. You make, a, you make a concentrated solution, a super saturated solution of salfamic, and it, it works slower than normal, normal acids, but, it, and, but faster than vinegar. And it won't harm the copper as much. You know, even vinegar will dissolve copper if you leave it in there too long. That, that, that's the problem. You know, you got to get rid of the calcite. If, if you got a lot of massive calcite around it, uh, I use a hammer and, and a pick and just, you know, like prepping a fossil, you, you want to get rid of all the extra rock until you get it down to where it's just a little bit left on there. And then maybe you don't even want to dissolve it after that. You know, Kathy? I'll give you some show and tell on this. So this copper yeah. is not from Michigan. Okay. It is from New Jersey. Bound Brook. And what? Bound Brook. Yes, indeed. And you'll, notice, and you'll notice that it's in, um, you'll notice that it's in calcite. And this was not dissolved out, although you could, it was hand chipped out. Because if you dissolve it in, if you use the uh, acid, you will get rid of the patina that naturally occurs on this. So this was actually hand chipped out of the, uh, out of the um, calcite almost exclusively. A teeny bit of uh, vinegar uh, or, and or uh, hydrochloric acid was used, but very little because otherwise what you do is you get rid of the patina and it, Looks shiny, and that's not the point, at least for most of these things. So, uh, and I will say that this was uh, recently cleaned. We'll leave it at that. This was recently uh, removed from the stone. So that's how you know a lot of us do these is very carefully. <laughs> is that you say it's from New Jersey? Whereabouts in New Jersey? Uh, Bound Brook, New Jersey. Chimney Rock Quarry. Huh, okay. Is it, is it a, a zeolite area? Uh, it's trap rock. Trap rock, okay. So we All do right. have trap some rock. zeolites there, yes. Oh, is that where they get the, the, the green sand for uh, using in water filters and, and iron prep and that sort of thing? The green no. sand? No? No. Green sand. Okay. No. 
I'm interested. That's a, that's a County. <laughs> Anybody have any to trade? <laughs> From here? Uh, send me a note. What's that? Send me, send me a note. I'll show send you what you I'll do. Well, you're going to have to send me an email. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a small one. Okay. I'm yeah, I've got the stuff. I've got some of the stuff from Pennsylvania, but I don't have any from New Jersey. Got some from Nova Scotia. Huh. Interesting. Dan, you have some other ones to share? You're muted now. You're muted. You're, there we go. This this is not from New Jersey. This is from Michigan. Okay. Uh, it's copper and epidote in basalt. Can put the thing behind it. Mm -hmm. And crystal. a large crystal that replaced most likely aragonite. This is a, um, it's, like, it's an octahedron crystal. And this thing is amazing. It is the only non-New Jersey copper that I have in the collection that is on display. This thing is amazing. It's a good sized crystal. Oh my God, it's gorgeous. It's an octahedron yeah. and it, it, it probably replaced aragonite or something like that. Mm, my favorite. No, no it, it's, I mean, the, the copper crystals grew that large without being a replacement. As an octahedron? Oh, yeah. Well, copper's cubic. Well, here you go. So any, any, of, the, any of the cubic formation, the octahedrons, the tetrahexahedrons, and, you know, they all, uh, they, you know, they find them. Cool. Um, yeah. Where did you say that was from again, Dan? You're muted, Dan. You're muted, Dan. He hit the button. Yeah, you back. It's somewhere from the uh, it's somewhere from the peninsula. I, I don't know the okay. don't know the exact provenance has been lost. Uh yeah, okay. What what's the matrix? Uh basalt and um epidote. Epidote, okay. Lots of it. They did find a nice seam with uh, crystals about that large up on the point, but I don't, it was in uh, it was uh, in a uh, probably a printite seam. But they do come that large, yes. I've got them. <laughs> <laughs> One quick point. Excuse me. This this doesn't show up too well, but this is a uh, Australian copper with a little crystal coal on it. Actually reminds me of those Bond Brook pieces, but uh, yeah, I'm still looking for a good piece of that too. I saw I saw it I saw it in an old Tucson show uh, DVD, but I, I haven't been able to find a, a, a decent uh, piece of the crystal and stuff. Yep. Anybody else with something to share? Yes. So Dave, we moved into show and tell. Show and tell. Yes. Yes. I will follow the fishers. And that way, I could show you mine. <laughs> okay, you ready to put your up? A little uh, white pine. White pine copper. Okay. Yeah. Wow, it looks like a bird on a on a bush. Uh, yeah, bird dragon. A little cuprite on the uh, pine end. Any silver on it? Some white. Yeah. Maybe a few tiny, tiny microcrystals. Yeah, yeah that, that's quite common. And they usually found that in a, in a seam of calcite underground. Someone else cleaned this one, thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah, that, I didn't have it. I didn't have it in the, in the program, but they did find big sheet uh, masses of sheet copper too. They got a big one at the seam, and that's like uh, ten foot by fifteen foot or something like that, sitting in the lobby. <laughs> so my turn. I'm gonna get some paper. Okay. Let's let's see if this shows without the paper. Leslie's looking for some paper. Um, so. Kathy's question was was perfect. That we have this one from Michigan, and it's extremely raise shiny. it up higher. We can't see. Good. Oh, picky, picky, picky. There we go. Can you see it now? Oh, I yeah. can't. Yeah. Too close. Right 
Okay, move it back. I'm not seeing it at all, which is very silver. frustrating. No. No. So you got silver on it? I don't think so. No. Sure okay, it's just the way the it. lights catch just the way the lights catching it. Yeah, what I'm gonna do is move to uh, gallery view so that I can even see what I'm seeing. No. There you go. So let's see what I'm doing to you. So it's very shiny. Uh, all we have is from Michigan. Can you move it? Move so it does here. move it closer? That's good. That's good. Okay. Andy tells me I don't want to wave it around, so I'm not going to wave it. Looks like an elongated cube going up in that long spike, but I couldn't tell. Yeah. So pretty piece, but it's followed by copper from uh, Kenawha Peninsula. So here is this one. Yeah, you can hold the paper and I'll hold the general. And, and so the question that Kathy asked about, is this the the best it's going to be for color, or should it be treated? Because the other has got the shiny. Ken is shaking his head. Uh, you devalue the from a mineral collector painted. standpoint. Uh, a, I'm sort of a purist on that sort of. Uh, I do have clean copper too, but uh, if it's got the natural patina on it, I don't. I don't fool with it. Um, uh, there's lots of tourist copper up there. I mean, you can take the copper and make it just as bright and shiny as you want to. Yeah. You know. That that is as good of an answer as you're ever going to get. And, <laughs> yeah. and then this one is polished, which we never do. We we have like two or three polished pieces from the Phoenix mine, and this has got the uh, printite with copper inclusions in it. Back it up, back it up a little bit. You're getting out back of it up a little bit. Okay, well, okay. And so that's just a we don't do polish, but in this case, it's just really cool. There's traces of copper uh, all through this face of it. You find a lot of that type of material at Cliff and. Uh, what used you know at Central, uh, that's what they were mining. They were mining a, a, a vein basically of trenite and ca and calcium and, and, a, and a seam. And there, there's a lot of copper included trenite, but uh, there's also a lot of little micro micro holes. Yeah, like that one. Whoa. Okay. So this is the unpolished side of that same piece, okay. and we're seeing what we think are copper seams through it. So not comparable to Susan's. You, usually we'd go before her. This time we defer. Oh, hey, hey, Jim. And just in case you were wondering if New Jersey actually had decent sized coppers, we do. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, New Jersey copper is, you know, I mean, the Edison mine and things like that. I mean, that's New Jersey copper is, is famous too. Yes, yeah, 25 pounds, this thing. This is not crystallized. It was out of, it was out of, it was just, it's flat. And it was that's out of, uh, it was that's, out of, that's, that's, a, that's what they call plate copper or sheet copper. It's a nice sheet. So we have it too. 1,000 thread count. <laughs> Anyone else with a question to share tonight? I can't lift up my 200 pound chunk of float. Hey, I do want to say this is the best presentations we've had. Thank you so much.